everybody and welcome to a beginner's guide to dragonflies and damselflies. My name is James, I'm a learning and engagement officer with Sussex Wildlife Trust and I'm going to be your guide today. So welcome to part one. Uh, in this hopefully you'll learn a few fun facts about the dragonflies uh, and their rather wonderful life cycle. So the dragonflies and the damselflies, they belong to an order of flying insects known as the Odonata. Um, the Odonata were classified a couple of hundred years ago now uh, by a Danish zoologist, a gentleman named Johan Christian Fabricius. So the term translates from the ancient Greek for tooth jaw, but to be honest with you, it, the significance of this is a bit strange because actually they're not the only insects to have teeth. So across the UK and Ireland, we've currently got about 47 species. Um, now we did have an additional two species that used to breed here, but unfortunately are now presumed extinct. Uh, and we've got another eight species that are not particularly common visitors. They're, they're rarer migrants to the UK. Now, of these 47 in total, uh, 20 of these uh, can be classified as damselflies and 27 can be classified as dragonflies. Now, the 27 dragonflies, these are known as the anisoptera, meaning unequal wings. The damselflies, however, are known as the zygoptera, uh, meaning equal wings. So what I will do is I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get to part two. So across the planet, we've got about 6,000 or so species. Uh, the UK has a relatively small percentage, at just under 1% overall. And, you know, we've got a real diversity of size across the whole planet. So the very smallest species have perhaps just a two centimetre wingspan. Uh, and of course, this makes them roughly the size of a bee. Uh, the very largest actually might reach up to about 19 centimetres, um, giving them a wingspan of roughly the size of a robin. Now, the question I really want to ask is, what is it that makes our dragonflies just so captivating? Well, truthfully, along with the butterflies, they really are a group of insects that people tend to see. Now, of course, this has been the case for an awfully long time, and it means that they're very deeply embedded in our folklore and mythology. You know, they're also a very diverse group of insects. They're very beautiful, they're very colourful, uh, they really are endlessly fascinating. Now, of course, they're also some of the most exciting insects to watch. I absolutely love watching dragonflies. So many of them live life at a very frenetic pace. Uh, you know, that's whether they're hunting or patrolling their territories, or sometimes engaged in these enormous kind of aerial battles, quite incredible to watch. Now, they're also very, very widespread, and truthfully, you really can see one almost anywhere. So don't think you need to live next door to a huge lake or a fast flowing river. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is, even if you have the tiniest of ponds in your garden, you're very, very likely to attract them. Now, of course, they're also not too overwhelming. So we have a very, very similar number of species overall to our butterflies. Of course, that means there isn't 10,000 or so species to worry about. And fortunately, they all have common names as well. And that makes things a whole lot easier. Now, the last thing I would say is that also a lot of the species are identifiable by the beginner. And of course, that is something that I aim to cover during these presentations. Okay, so now that I've blitzed you with two pages of text, I thought we'd try something a little bit more fun, and we're gonna play a game of myth or fact. Now, I appreciate this game is not quite as interactive as I'd like, but we're gonna go with it nonetheless, and we're gonna start off with a picture of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with dragonflies at all, but it is pertinent to the question that I'd like to ask, which is whether dragonfly evolutionary lineage predates the dinosaurs. What do you think? Does this sound likely or unlikely? Well, I can tell you that this is a fact. So dragonfly lineage actually dates back for more than 325 million years. Now this was to a period of time known as the Carboniferous, uh, and actually it was about 125 million years before any of the first dinosaurs appeared in the Triassic period. Now this really does mark dragonflies as one of the most successful animal groups on the planet. 
Now, although modern day dragonflies have some anatomical differences, there's little doubt that they have evolved from these gigantic dragonfly-like ancestors. Now, some of these may well have benefited from the higher levels of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere at the time. Now, just to give you an idea of the scale, here's a little indication of just how big some of these ancestors might have been. Absolutely incredible. Now, I'm sure we can all agree that were a dragonfly this size to land on you, you would get more than a little bit of a shock, and I think that might be putting it mildly. Now, these extinct Meganosoptera, they were actually some of the very largest flying insects ever to exist on the planet. Now, fossilized reconstructions of their wings indicate that they may have had a span of around 75 centimeters with a body length approaching half a meter. Incredible. Okay, number two, dragonflies live for no more than a few days. Now, does that sound plausible or rather implausible? What do you think? Well, I can tell you that that is in fact a myth. It's a myth, everybody. So in reality, the life cycle of a dragonfly, it really varies very substantially. And from egg to adult, it may well last around six months to a number of years, but it really does depend on the species. Now, the adults with which we're familiar, they actually are fairly short-lived, and even some of our very largest dragonflies may well survive for only a couple of months. Now, most of the dragonfly's life is actually undertaken by the larvae. They are very, very predatory, but they also live underwater, which is why we don't really see them. Now, the larvae actually, they will molt their skin many times before finally undergoing what is known as incomplete or partial metamorphosis, and this is where they will eventually transition into their adult form. Okay, next one. Dragonflies can move in any direction and fly at speeds exceeding 25 miles per hour. Now, does that sound probable or rather improbable? What do you think? Well, I can tell you that is a fact. So dragonfly power, agility and stamina is absolutely remarkable, uh, perhaps almost unparalleled. They have these huge flight muscles within the thorax, uh, which control their wings independently. And this of course allows them for really, really precise control. Now, there's little doubt, actually, that their powers of flight would probably shame a modern jet fighter. They have this colossal power-to-weight ratio. It equates to generating G-forces that are simply far beyond human capacity. Now, 25 miles per hour might not sound like a really high top speed to us, but actually this equates to more than 10 to 15 meters per second, or more than 100 body lengths per second in forward flight. Now, their powers of flight continues to pave the development of future aircraft, and it's actually already inspired both drone technology and space exploration. Now, this is through something known as unsteady aerodynamics. Now, that might sound a little bit disastrous to you and me, but it is in fact pivotal to this almost otherworldly flight. Humans have ultimately learned an awful lot about flight from dragonflies. Okay, everybody, so on to the last one now. Dragonflies can sting and harm humans. Now, does that sound possible or rather impossible? What do you think? Well, I can tell you that that is a myth. So dragonflies are completely harmless to humans. Now, the females have an egg-laying device. This is known as an ovipositor. Uh, it may look like a sting, but it's actually used purely to lay their eggs. Now, they do have these biting mouth parts. Uh, it does allow them to bite, but in almost all cases, not through human skin and never in spontaneous attack. So it's only the very largest of dragonfly species that would be able to penetrate human skin. And you really would have to be holding the dragonfly, forcing it to defend itself 
So it's a very, very unlikely scenario. Now, dragonflies, of course, they do use their mandibles uh, when it comes to predating other insects. They really are fearsome predators. And actually, their success in hunting, it's truly phenomenal, vastly higher than the majority of terrestrial animals. So, for example, their legs are highly specialized for catching prey. You'll very rarely see a dragonfly walking, that is for sure. They're also able to utilize their incredible compound eyes, which are packed with thousands of individual photoreception units. Okay, everybody, so for the last part of the presentation, we're going to move on to a little bit about biology and talking about the life cycle. So the very first part of this is, of course, egg laying. Now, female dragonflies, uh, they may well lay their eggs directly into plant material, as in the example of this brown hawker here. So essentially, they'll be using the blade-like ovipositor uh, to slice into the vegetative matter. Uh, otherwise, what they may do is scatter them somewhat randomly into the water. Now, an individual dragonfly may lay hundreds of eggs in total, and this may well be over a number of separate days. And the method really does depend on the species in question. So in the example of this emperor dragonfly, uh, actually what she's doing is she's laying her eggs directly into the vegetative matter below the surface of the water. Now this may differ substantially uh, from a species like this broad body chaser, who is basically dipping her abdomen just into the water and just depositing her eggs below the water's surface. Okay, folks, so the next part of the life cycle uh, is the larval stage, uh, the nymph stage. Pretty fearsome looking things, I'm sure you'll agree. So most species, they'll usually hatch from the eggs within a few weeks. Uh, a number of species might actually delay their hatching until more suitable conditions arise next spring. Now the nymphs, they'll slowly develop over either a few months or maybe even a few years, and they'll molt many times in this stage in order to grow. Now, depending on the species, they'll usually molt somewhere between five to 14 times. Now, these nymphs, they are voracious predators, and they will eat almost anything that is smaller than themselves. Now, the nymphs actually have what's known as a prehensile labium. Now, this is basically an extending lower jaw to you and me. Now, for anybody who's familiar with the Alien film franchise, you might remember that the creatures also had extending mouth parts, something that was very likely influenced by dragonfly and damselfly nymphs. Now, isn't it amazing to think that the inspiration for so many horror films comes from the weird world of insects? Okay, so once the nymphs have completed the underwater stage of their lives, they have to actually climb out of the water in order to complete their final molt and transition into adult form. Now, I should say this often happens in the morning. So actually, this is the perfect time to get outside and check the vegetation and structure around your pond to see if you can find any emerging dragonflies and damselflies. Now, once they have emerged, they start to redistribute their body fluids, which enables them to withdraw from the larval skin, and it starts a hardening process. Now, the hardening process usually takes up to a few hours, uh, and it leaves behind this malted skin, which is known as an exuvia. So in this picture on the left, you can actually see the hole where the adult dragonfly has climbed out of the larval skin. Now, once the adult dragonflies have emerged from their larval skin, they're actually known as tenorals. Now, tenorals are quite unusual because they tend to lack colour pigmentation, and this can make them really hard to identify uh, from the more typically coloured adults. Now, as such, I'm actually not going to cover tenorals during these presentations. Now, of course, as the dragonflies and damselflies mature, uh, they reach breeding age. Now, when this happens, you may well see pairs uh, engaged in a very unusual position, uh, which is known as the copulation wheel. Now, if you look at these red damselflies on the left, uh, you can see that actually they have a wheel in the shape of a heart, which is all very romantic. Uh, but seriously, the wheel is a very interesting thing to look out for. 
And you can also see in this example, a pair of keeled skimmer dragonflies where the blue male on top is actually gripping onto the head of the female in order to keep her in place while they mate. Okay folks, well that concludes part one of a beginner's guide to dragonflies and damselflies. And join me again in part two, where we'll be asking just what are the differences between dragonflies and damselflies, looking at some of the key family groupings and also some of the main identification features.